There was a um, very successful uh, movie and, and, and previous to that book not too many years ago called The Perfect Storm in which this horrendous storm comes about because of several smaller storms that, that coalesce into one, one giant catastrophe. Um, I think something like that is, is developing for industrial civilization as a whole. We have peak oil, we have global climate change, which is, is becoming uh, just a, a horrendous, horrendous catastrophe on the horizon. Uh, with you know the polar ice melting, which is uh, op opening huge areas of, of sea in, in the polar regions, uh, w without that ice, which normally reflects sunlight, uh, the, the, that polar sea is now going to be absorbing a lot more uh, sunlight and therefore heat, and causing kind of a self-reinforcing feedback loop. So it's it's very possible that. Uh, global climate change is is out of our control at this point. No matter what we do, whether we implement Kyoto or or Kyoto on steroids or whatever it is, it's really too late to do much about it. And then global population growth. Uh, we've probably already overshot the Earth's long-term carrying capacity for human beings. Uh, we passed six billion in uh, I think 1998 or 1999. Just since then we've added another half billion people. Um, so the rate of growth is starting to slow, but we're still a adding people every year, something like uh, 80 million people a year. Um, and we, we just, we're not adding resources to, uh, to feed all of those people and, and keep them in, in, the, in the way of life to which they would like to become accustomed. And then producing food for all of those people is a problem because we're, we're running out of arable land and fresh water. So in fact, the per capita rate of food production has been declining for the past several years, even though population is still increasing. So you start adding all of these things together and how uh, peak oil will further undermine global carrying capacity for the growing population and how uh, uh, global climate change will do the same thing. Uh, and it's not too hard to start coming up with, with real sort of doomsday scenarios. Now, no one wants to see that happen, but you know, we, we've really been ignoring these problems for far too long. And if you ignore problems for too long, they, they come to a, a crisis stage, and that's what we're looking at. Over the last 150 years, we've created a society that, that runs on oil. We've, uh, we've come to use oil for just about everything that we possibly can, and it's inevitable that we would have done so, because it's just such incredibly inexpensive, convenient, energy-dense stuff. And we, we human beings are energy junkies, always have been, always will be. It goes all the way back to the harnessing of fire. Uh, and oil is, is like winning the energy lottery. I mean, think about it. If, if you had to push your car for 20 miles, you know, it, maybe you've had the experience of running out of gas and you have to push your car to the side of the road, maybe push it 6 feet, 10 feet. It's a big job. But imagine pushing your car 20 miles. Well, that's what a single gallon of gasoline does for us. And we pay, what, 3 bucks for it and complain about that. Uh, the, the amount of energy in a gallon of gasoline is, is equivalent to something like six weeks of human labor. So, you know, it was, it was inevitable that we would become hooked on this stuff. And so we've created planes, trains, and automobiles, and, and uh, plastics, and uh, petrochemicals, and everything else that, that makes modern life what it is. The problem, of course, is that oil is a non-renewable resource. So even when we first started using the stuff, we knew that eventually we'd run out. We thought that would be a long, in a long time, but, uh, and actually we're not about to, to, to literally run out. But the problem is that the cheap, easy stuff is gone. We've picked the low-hanging fruit. Um, discoveries of new oil peaked right around 1963, 64, 
I remember 1964, that was the year the Beatles appeared on Ed Sullivan's show. So that, that was a long time ago. So we're not talking about a couple of years of, of bad luck in exploration. This is a long established trend. We've been discovering less oil with every passing year. It's at the point now where we're extracting and using about four or five barrels of oil for every one that we discover. Uh, and country after country is reaching its own national all-time oil production peak and going into decline. The U.S. was one of the first to do it back in 1970, and now something like 30 or 33 countries are past their peak. And so we just have a very few countries that are still able to increase their rate of production on a yearly basis to make up for those, those declines, for all that depletion in those past peak countries. And it's inevitable that within the very next few years, we'll see the global peak in oil production. Nobody's ready for that because uh, we've, we've had a regime over the past 150 years where every year there's been more oil available to fuel economic growth. And we've built an economy based on the idea that, that it has to grow every year or else collapse. So soon the economy won't be able to grow. And all signs are that we may be facing a kind of global economic collapse because of peak oil. We desperately need uh, more renewable energy sources. We need more photovoltaics, we need more solar thermal, we need more wind, all of those things. But I think we're deluding ourselves to imagine that we can run the American economy or the world economy in anything like its present form using those renewable alternatives, at least not anytime soon. Here in the U.S., we're getting a small fraction of 1% of our total energy budget from solar and wind combined right now. Of course, we could be getting a lot more, but we'll need decades and hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars of investment in order to achieve that. And that, that level of investment, that rate of growth, simply isn't happening right now. And then there's a question as to whether, even in the ideal instance, those renewable alternatives could actually fuel uh, the kind of industrial society that we have right now. We are using currently about twice as much renewable energy in the U.S. economy today as we were in 1850. Uh, the, the American population has grown by something like three or four hundred percent in the meantime. And all of the energy growth, which has been enormous in that interim, has been in non-renewable energy sources. Well, why is that? Well, the reason is that the, those non-renewable fossil fuel energy sources have been so cheap by comparison that renewable energy, which is mostly these days in the form of hydroelectric uh, power, just ha hasn't, hasn't really caught on. So. Uh, if we're going to move toward more renewables, we have to get used to the idea of energy being more expensive, and uh, we have to get used to the idea of having much less energy to deal with. And this goes also for liquid fuels, biofuels like ethanol and biodiesel, which uh, have very low energy profit ratios compared to oil, and will take lots and lots of cropland to produce. Yes, we can run our cars on biodiesel or ethanol, but we have to take into account the fact that uh, we only have so much cropland, and uh, we could very easily get ourselves into a situation where if it's you know, economically fe more feasible to produce, say, uh, ethanol than, than food, we could you know, uh, have millions of people starving so that thousands of people can drive their cars. I think the two hurricanes, Katrina and Rita, have prematurely catapulted us into the, uh, the peak oil period. Uh, whereas previously, I think it was possible to imagine a global oil production peak occurring in maybe 2008, 2010, and up to that time we'd be gradually increasing our rate of production, and then after that time we'd be on the long slide downward. I think now we're in a kind of bumpy plateau period where further uh, natural disasters and political events and economic events 
are going to result in repeated supply crises and uh, demand destruction. So that uh, we'll see uh, all the elements of an oil crisis appear and it will be something that we can blame on a hurricane or a revolution in a Middle Eastern country or in, in West Africa or South America. And then things will gradually recover. We'll have a recession from the high oil prices and then that will cause demand to go down. And then prices will go back down and, and people will think, well, everything's okay now. And all of this will hide the underlying fact that we're actually at the, that long-term or all-time peak in oil production. And it won't be until maybe 10 years from now that we'll be able to look back and say, well, yeah, that was it. We're past peak now. And sometime during that 10-year period, we, we hit the top. But it's, it, it'll be hard to determine exactly when that exact moment was that we, we passed the top. Our current economic paradigm goes back to the days of European colonialism. Uh, Europe, European society was basically expanding outward to encompass the rest of the world, to control the rest of the world's resources. And so that created economic growth for Europe. And so the very first uh, economic theorists started to build this idea of growth into their theories. Now, during the 19th and 20th centuries, as fossil fuels came along, we had enormous expansion in human capabilities. We had energy available to fuel industrialization and the growth of everything, of, of mechanization, using machines to do work that formerly had been, been done by human beings. So that also created enormous growth. So as economics, as a, a system developed, of course, we, we, we think of economics these days as a science, but economics is not a science. It started out as a moral philosophy, and it still is, in effect, a, a, a kind of moral philosophy. But into the, the, the very bedrock of economics, whether it's leftist economics or rightist economics, Marxist or, or free market, it doesn't matter. It's all, all basically the same, is this idea that mechani mechanization is inevitable and that the economy will, can, and must continue to grow. Now, of course, this is an absurdity because we live on a finite spherical planet. So there's only so much stuff to chew up and spit out. Uh, but we have this economic theory now that we're burdened with, which says that, that we have to chew up and spit out more all the time. We've even created a, a monetary system that underscores this. Uh, we, our money is created through bank loans these days. It's not backed up by gold or silver. It's, it's essentially fiat money that's it's, it's created by the act of making a loan. When the loan's repaid, the money disappears. So the, all of those loans, of course, have interest attached to them. So if the interest is going to be paid on all of the loans that exist, that means that the money supply has to continually grow. And if the money supply stops growing, that means that a lot of people are going to default on their loans and money just disappears from the economy and we have a deflationary depression, which is what we had in, back in the 1930s. So in order to avoid a deflationary depression, we have to have continual growth in the money supply which has to be based on continual growth in economic activity, which must be based on the continual growth in available energy and raw materials to fuel economic activity. Well, of course, that's simply not in the cards. We can't have that because it's physically impossible. You know, I don't think the corporations really get it. Uh, certainly there, there are individuals operating within the, the oil companies, um, many of the car companies and so on. I talk to people all the time who, who work for big companies who, who definitely do get it. But they tend to be the, the engineers, the geologists, the, the, the people who, who uh, have a lot of skills but aren't in the top decision-making ranks. The people in the top decision-making ranks tend to be people from business schools who've taken economics classes, who have been conditioned to believe that growth is the normal state of affairs and that we can't run out of any 
resources because the market uh, won't let us. You know, if, if something starts to get scarce, well, the price goes up. That encourages more exploration or encourages the production of um, substitutes and alternatives, encourages conservation. And so there's always just this easy transition to the next thing, whatever it is, which is always better than whatever we had before. Well, real life isn't like that. I mean, what's, uh, what's easier and better and cheaper than oil, for example? Well, we really don't know. I mean, there are other things that, you know, are, are better from an ecological point of view, you know, that don't have the problems with uh, greenhouse gas emissions and so on. But in terms of cheaper and able to run a modern industrial economy, well, there really isn't anything. Uh, you know, tar sands to substitute for oil, forget it. All that stuff is, is way more expensive. It's going to take a lot more effort to get out of the ground and process. So we're, we're really looking at a situation that we're not at all prepared for. The people in the corporations and in, in the decision-making places and corporations really don't get it. They don't understand. They're flying blind. Globalization is an economic strategy that's based on the availability of cheap transportation fuels. We transport raw materials and manufactured products in ever larger quantities, ever further distances. Well, that's fine. It allows us uh, to take advantage of econ economies of scale. You know, some places are good for growing crops. Other places have uh, lots of mineral deposits and so on. So you can take advantage of those local availabilities of cheap whatever to make one giant economic system where everything is, is cheaper and, and more abundant. But if you take away the cheap transportation fuels, all of that starts to come apart. Um, think of agriculture, for example. Uh, we're uh, growing food in places like um, you know, Kansas and, and, uh, and Iowa and Missouri and, and shipping it to Africa and, uh, and Asia. Meanwhile, uh, local small farmers in Africa and Asia are giving up farming and moving into the cities either to get jobs in, in sweatshops and factories or to just be sort of a, a permanently unemployed underclass. Well, what's going to happen to all those people when we're no longer able to grow food in huge quantities cheaply using um, fuel-fed tractors and harvesters and combines and, and ship it uh, tens of or thousands of miles uh, with, with ships and trains and, and airplanes and so on? we could have a lot of people starving. So we have to relocalize our economies. We have to move producers and consumers back closer together. We have to produce food and just about everything else with as few fossil fuel inputs as we possibly can and relearn a lot of those handcraft skills that our ancestors once, once knew. Um, who in our local communities, for example, makes shoes anymore? We, we buy all our shoes at Walmart or at the mall, and they all come from China. But, uh, you know, how long will be, we be able to do that? We have to learn again how to make things for ourselves. A, a deliberate process of simplification or, or collapse would, would have to include efforts to, uh, to grow more of our own food, to provide for more of our own needs, to take account of all of those things where we are dependent on the larger social networks and start to reweave that network in a way that is uh, more local and more dependent on resources that are at hand as opposed to resources that come from, from far away. Um, our clothing, our, our tools, uh, it, it's not that we each have to do all of these things for ourselves, but you know, if you're going to use metal tools, it'd be nice to know somebody who knows something about metalworking, who, who, somebody who knows something about uh, blacksmithing. If, if you're going to wear shoes, it'd be nice to know somebody who knows how to make shoes. It'd be nice to know somebody who knows how to butcher a steer and produce leather. I mean, if you're going to wear leather shoes, I happen to be a vegetarian, okay, for my reasons, that's fine, but uh, let's be real here, you know. Uh, if, if, if we're going to um, persist 
as a species, we're going to have to find ways of relocalizing and re-indigenizing all of the life support mechanisms that will be required in order to support us in a simpler and more localized way of, of, of being. The collapse of civilization is uh, a phrase that strikes fear into the hearts of most people, and it's understandable. Uh, when we look back at uh, civilizations of the past, the Roman, Mayan civilization, uh, various iter iterations of Chinese civilization and so on, periods of collapse were very uh, messy and destructive. and. Uh, uh, that's not, not something we would like to imagine happening around us right now. Uh, but I have come to understand collapse in more of a technical sense uh, after reading uh, a book by Joseph Tainter, The Collapse of Complex Societies, which is really a, a fabulous, uh, very important study of, of the subject of, of, uh, uh, of collapse. Uh, Tainter defines collapse as the reduction in the complexity of a society. Okay, He doesn't say how that's going to happen or how quickly it happens. In fact, in most historical instances, collapse has not happened suddenly in a matter of a day or a month or uh, a year. It's taken something like a, a century, even five centuries for societies to, to collapse or to reduce their, their scale of complexity. Well, we are living in a society today whose complexity is unprecedented and unsustainable. So it's inevitable that our society will have to reduce its scale and complexity over time. We have to reduce the human population and the impact of that population on the environment and the rate of consumption of resources per capita within our society. Okay, you can define that any way you want, but in one way or another, that's collapse. Now, we can do it the hard way, <laughs> or we can do it the easy way. The hard way is to avoid change until the very end when absolute catastrophe overtakes us. And we could, in fact, face a, a relatively uh, quick and chaotic and ruinous collapse. Or we could undertake the process of simplification in a, a deliberate and cooperative way, in which case I think we could preserve some of the best of what we've achieved over the past few centuries. And we have achieved a lot. You know, our, our artistic and intellectual uh, and scientific achievements are nothing to, to give up without, without a fight. Fundamentally, our economy and our, our entire socio-political system are unsustainable and that has consequences to it. Now that means that in one way or another it has to change or collapse. Now how that happens is anybody's guess. It could happen very quickly. Uh, a major natural disaster like the two recent hurricanes, uh, a serious earthquake on the west coast, Something like that could, could cause the entire house of cards to collapse very quickly. Uh, the U.S. dollar is poised for a downfall because of the fact that the U.S. economy is based on so much debt. It's really unsupportable. Any other country with this much uh, government debt and also uh, balance of trade deficit could not survive. Its, its economy would, would collapse in no time. The only reason the U.S. is able to keep the game going so long is that there's this artificial demand for U.S. dollars that's created by the fact that the IMF and World Bank have made all of these loans in U.S. dollars that have to be repaid in U.S. dollars, and all of the oil-producing countries in the world sell their, their oil for U.S. dollars. That creates this, this artificial demand that keeps people coming back to U.S. banks for more loans and, and keeps uh, other countries investing in U.S. Treasury bills and so on. But if at some point uh, China and Japan and all of the other countries decide that uh, the U.S. dollar is not a particularly good investment and they stop buying T-bills, well, the U.S. dollar would sink like a stone. And all of this could happen within a matter of, of weeks or months. 
On the other hand, you know, it's, it's possible that the folks in charge will find clever ways of keeping the thing going and going and going, and it'll just gradually unravel, and 20 years from now we'll, we'll say, my gosh, things sure are in a sorry state, but how did they get this way? And, and we'll look back and, and we'll see, you know, gee, it, we've been on a real downslope here for quite some time. As important resources become scarce, uh, the overwhelming likelihood is that we human beings will fight over them. Uh, we've fought over scarce resources for centuries and millennia. Oil, of course, is the most important strategic resource of the last hundred years, and we've already had a number of oil wars during the 20th century and even already during the beginning of the, of the 21st century. So. Uh, when we look out beyond the, the peak of global oil production, as we have actual scarcities in oil, um, the overwhelming likelihood, as I said, is, is that, that we'll have uh, not only wars between uh, consuming nations like the U.S. and China, but also between uh, producing and consuming nations, uh, producing nations that might want to withhold some of their oil from the world market, or consuming nations that might not want to pay the going, going price <laughs> might want to, to capture some of those resources for their, their use. We're likely to see more um, civil wars within producing nations for control of, of resources, and so on. More terrorism. Uh, now, none of that is a, a particularly happy uh, prospect. So what would be the alternative to that? Well, it would have to be some kind of, of power down process whereby the countries of the world would agree voluntarily to reduce their reliance on fossil fuels. Now, this is a, this is a tough sell, but I think it actually could be done with something like a global oil depletion protocol. If producing nations were to agree to produce less oil on an annual basis and consuming nations were to agree to, to reduce their, their imports, then I think there's the possibility of, of reducing the impact of high prices and volatile prices and also reduce the, uh, the scale of uh, competition and conflict over remaining supplies. Uh, this kind of global oil depletion protocol is something, I think, unprecedented in world history. I think it's a long shot, but it deserves um, uh, some, some effort. Uh, because if we can achieve that kind of agreement, uh, I think we could possibly avert what could be uh, war for the remainder of our lifetimes that could easily, very easily, uh, morph over into, into global nuclear war. So almost any effort is worth, uh, is, is worth it in terms of, of averting that kind of, of scenario. Uh, <clears throat> I think the producing nations could be talked into a, a, an oil depletion protocol fairly easily because very few of them have the capability of increasing their production anyway. Um, something, someone like Hugo Chavez, I think, could be probably talked into signing on to the depletion protocol because it would be a grand political gesture such as he likes to make anyway. Uh, and Venezuela's past peak, its, its production is going to be declining anyway, so why not, why, not make a, uh, why not make a gesture out of it? Other countries like China and the U.S., uh, importing countries, are going to be a little harder to sell on this. But I think if, if leaders are made to understand, and if populations in those countries, the people, the citizens, can be made to understand that, in fact, they're going to have to wean themselves off of oil anyway, no matter what they do. Even if they fight over what's left, the situation is going to be even worse for them because those, those battles, those wars, will destroy oil availability. They won't, they won't make things easier in any sense. If people can be made to understand what the alternatives are, then I think there's a good possibility that, uh, that even those countries could be talked into uh, adopting the depletion protocol. Uh, Unfortunately, I think the one thing that could keep countries from, from signing on would be the fact that there are so many apparently authoritative folks out there 
saying that, in fact, we don't have to worry about depletion of non-renewable resources like oil and natural gas because the market will solve everything or because there's actually lots more out there. Um, you know, there's tar sands. We could turn coal into oil. Uh, there's lots of renewables. The, the market will make the transition for us in an easy, uh, comfortable way. And those, those voices of optimism, ironically, are, I think, our worst enemy. They're, they're the, that, that voice is, is most likely to undermine our survival. Because what that does is it, it, it encourages, encourages us to go back to sleep and not take the strenuous actions that will be necessary in, in order for us to make the transition away from fossil fuel dependency. So if, in fact, we follow those, those voices of optimism, then I think we'll, we'll find ourselves in a situation where we'll have no choice but to fight over the remaining resources, and we will see the collapse of industrial society. If that's the case, then I think the only other um, option available to us will be to develop some kind of lifeboat strategy where small groups of people uh, scattered around the world would take it upon themselves, first of all, to uh, try to survive by whatever means necessary, but also to preserve whatever is best about culture, about humanity, whatever is best that we've actually achieved over the last couple of hundred years and more, uh, and, and save that for future generations. Uh, we saw something like that with the, the monasteries of the Middle Ages, which preserved the best of, of what had existed in, in classical times in the Greco-Roman civilization. Uh, and those, those monasteries provided the seed of the, the further growth and flourishing of, of culture in, in Europe uh, in the centuries that came afterward. Um, there's a lot about industrial civilization and Western civilization in general that, that I think um, are not really worth preserving. I mean, you know, Disneyland and Walmart and, and TV commercials and all of that I think could, could go tomorrow and, and we wouldn't really miss them. But on the other hand, there's a lot of scientific knowledge that's been achieved uh, through long, hard work that it would really be a shame to, uh, to give up um, simply because the rest of, of our civilization came apart at the seams and, and we didn't anticipate it and we didn't make the effort to preserve that information that, and that knowledge that's, that's so precious and so hard won. Yeah. I think survivalism in the conventional sense of the term has very little prospect for success. Why? Because uh, if you or your family or if your little intentional community is, is trying to survive for its own sake, uh, let's say you have your, your nice permaculture vegetable garden uh, and, your, and your goats and, and chickens and so on. Well, if your neighbors are starving and they've stockpiled a few guns, as a lot of folks in this country have, guess who's going to be eating out of your garden? And even if you have a few guns of your own, well, who's going to have the most ammunition? You know, this, this line of thinking starts to uh, become pretty scary and, and, uh, and despairing after, pretty quickly, in fact. Whereas if you have something like what I call a preservationist community, where you are preserving nature and culture and, and uh, skills, life sustaining skills and then teaching those skills to the surrounding community, then the people around your community are going to protect you. You are providing them with concrete, tangible uh, goods, things that, that you know how to make that they need, and also with the skills that they need to survive and produce the, the things that they themselves and their neighbors will need. So if we have communities that are seeds for culture and for the, the growth and renewal of culture, I think there's the possibility that uh, they're for, for, for real survival. 
Um, whereas survivalism in the classical sense, I think, is, is really a dead end. What will it take to affect uh, real fundamental change? I think it's going to take three things. First of all, the perception of the need for change. And here I think it's going to have to be literally a crisis situation that, that everyone perceives as a crisis. Um, for Americans, I think the only thing that's, that's likely to make them really change their behavior that much is uh, serious economic pain. Very high gasoline prices, natural gas prices, uh, extreme levels of unemployment and so on. I hate to say these things. I mean, no one wants these sorts of, of uh, things to, to happen in terms of, of, the, of the, the real effects that, it, that these things will have on people's lives and families and so on. But I think that's the only thing that's going to get people's attention. Second, I think it's going to require uh, people around to provide an explanation for why things are the way they are, that people can grasp and understand. If people think that the, the pain they're feeling is simply the result of this or that group of evil people, maybe on the other side of the planet in the Middle East, or uh, one political party or, or the other, or something like that, then that's not going to lead anywhere. Uh, just finding scapegoats is, is no solution because what we're talking about is the need for fundamental change in our, our whole way of life. The third thing that's going to be required is um, people, again, on the scene and prominent with specific plans and ideas for how to make the transition. Without all three of those things in place, I think we're just spinning our wheels, and I don't think any real change is likely. No, we're, we're entering a time of uh, radical, drastic change in everything that, that, uh, that, that we know and understand as human beings. Every cultural anchor that, that we have deep within our psyche is about to be ripped out and uh, it's going to be profoundly dis dislocating. Um, it would be nice to think that this is all going to be over very quickly. And that, you know, in a few years we can look back and we, we will have this, this new human society that we've built. And by golly, uh, it was all worth it. It was tough. But the overwhelming likelihood is that this process of, of transition and change is going to go on for decades. And most of us who are alive today, maybe, maybe none of us who are alive today will actually live to see some, anything that you could call an end result of this process of change. So how do we keep going through that? How do we motivate, motivate ourselves knowing that you know, we personally are not going to you know, see the promised land, as it were? Well, I think we have to, um, first of all, understand that and accept that and not you know, have this... See, that, that's part of, of the lure of the, uh, of the fundamentalist mentality that says that you know, the, the revelation will happen and, and we'll all be caught up into heaven and... Uh, you know, it's not that simple, unfortunately. Uh, life usually just doesn't work that way. <laughs> Things are harder and messier than that. Uh, so I, I think we're, we're, we're going to have to take our, our pleasure and our satisfaction in the process itself rather than expecting an end result. And if we can see the process as one of, of learning and contributing and, and deepening our own sense of, of humanness and humaneness, uh, I think there's plenty of sat satisfaction to be had there. You know, there are some people who, um, who look for a line of work that's inherently challenging. They go into emergency response, you know, and they end up working with accident victims, and they're, they're the ones who are out on the highway when there's been an, an accident, and they're, they're taking care of the people who, who are in just the most extreme situations. Who would want such a job? It must be extremely taxing. Well, I think there have to be some of us who, who take our fulfillment 
from being in those extreme situations and being and, and have, having the willingness to be fully conscious and present because that's the kind of situation that we're facing for our whole species during the next few decades we are going to be in extremity and uh, it'll be so easy to just shut off and and shut down and uh, and go into depression or denial or blame and uh, none of that will be very helpful actually the only thing that will be helpful is to actually be present and aware and willing to reach out and help and teach and care for and understand from moment to moment and I think when we do that actually that that will be a very rewarding experience you know nobody knows whether collapse will happen uh, this year or next or ten years from now or you know maybe we can uh, muddle along for another twenty or thirty years who knows but assuming that it's not likely to happen for another 20 or 30 years I think is extremely dangerous because we need time to prepare ourselves individually and as a society for this immense transition that we will be going through and the more that we can do to prepare ourselves the better off we'll be uh, the kinds of things that we need to do well we need to prepare ourselves um, physically uh, in terms of, of um, our, our environment and, uh, and, and the kinds of tools that, that we will need to, to have available to us. We need to prepare ourselves mentally to develop the kinds of skills that we'll, we will need to help make the transition and skills that we can teach other people. And we, I think we need to develop, uh, prepare ourselves spiritually in a sense too because this is going to be an extraordinarily challenging time that we'll be, we'll, we'll be going through as a society and uh, if we're completely unprepared for this, um, if, we, if we don't have uh, the, the spiritual resources to not only deal with these tremendous challenges and changes ourselves but also to, to be able to uh, help and comfort others and reassure them and, and provide them with a uh, mythological or scientific way of of understanding what's happening and uh, and and going through this this experience themselves. If we don't have that, then I think uh, we'll we'll be much worse off than if if we have that that time to prepare. So, you know, do we have twenty years, thirty years to prepare? Probably not. But to imagine that we do, to assume that we do, I think is very dangerous, actually. It's, it's easy to get stuck in, in the space of saying, uh, you know, collapse is, is, a, is a possibility, but it's, it's far off. Keep it at, at arm's length. It's a possibility, something we can intellectually discuss, but it's, it's not real. Um, on the other hand, if, if you are at the point of really looking that eventuality in the face and saying, okay, collapse is inevitable, and it could happen tomorrow, then suddenly it, uh, it, it opens a different kind of space in, in your head. You start looking at the world differently and, and uh, <laughs> it, it's funny what happens. It all starts to look very tenuous and, and almost imaginary and you, you start seeing the real lines of, of force in the world and how things are likely to change and and rearrange themselves and what the opportunities are as well as as things to avoid um, all of that is is completely hidden it's 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 not available as long as we surround ourselves with with the hope and you know hope is usually a good thing but but I think hope can be perilous if it if it blinds us to the reality of the situation that we're in I think a good exercise for individuals or small groups of people is to take a period of time, maybe start with 24 hours, and live as if a collapse has already occurred within that, that period of time. In other words, uh, no electricity, um, 
uh, running water, well, s save up some for the, for the occasion. Uh, certainly no car, uh, but put yourself in that, in that situation, maybe in your f familiar surroundings, but, but without all of the accoutrements that, that, that we're accustomed to deriving from the, the, the network of, of social services that we're all plugged into on a daily basis. You know, the, the lights, the entertainment machines, the computer, uh, all of that stuff. And get used to it. And s see just how dependent you are on all of that stuff. And start to find within yourself the psychological resources to do without them. You, know, you can't be alive today without some sense that something fundamentally is screwy in terms of, uh, of how the world is working. You know, whether it's the evidence of ecological collapse or, or growing economic inequality in the world or, and, and, and growing levels of, of uh, just violence and dysfunction, uh, it's, it's pretty clear that, that we're, we're on a, a disastrous trajectory. But um, the, for the most part, we don't have very good stories for explaining this to ourselves. We don't have any understanding of why this is happening or where it's likely to lead us. So to, to, uh, um, to learn from cultural anthropology and from history and from ecology and, and, and the study of population and resources and, and genetics and biology and all, all of these, these sciences to start to piece together a bigger picture that, that explains just how and why we've gotten here and what our options are, it is kind of a relief. Even if, even if it is scary, even if it, it, even if it underscores the perilousness of the condition, at least we can understand what's happening to us and there's some sense of, of a way forward. It's pretty easy to see civilization as kind of a huge mistake because after all, uh, it's, it's resulted in the creation of this uh, this way of life where there's extreme economic inequality and we're uh, busy destroying the, the, the life support basis for our species and for uh, thousands, maybe even millions of other species. Uh, but, you know, from a larger perspective, I think civilization was more or less inevitable. Given what, we, what and who we are as a as a, a biological organism, given our genetic makeup, and given the environmental factors that we were faced with, I think uh, it was pretty much inevitable that we would create something like civilization. I mean, go back to the end of the, of the Pleistocene era. Uh, climate changed dramatically then. Of course, that was the age of, of megafauna when we had developed the technological means, the, 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 the the stone uh, points and arrows and spears and, and, and atlatls and all the things that enabled us to be able to hunt those, those uh, giant animals. And then we went around the world and hunted a lot of them to extinction in North and South America and Australia and other places. So we had to start relying on other food sources. Uh, given our unique intelligence and our, our linguistic ability, as human beings, it wasn't too much of a stretch for us to start figuring out how to domesticate animals and plants. And once we did that and started planting food instead of just gathering it, then we had the, uh, the situation of seasonal surpluses that could then be stored for the next, next season or the next year. But as soon as you have food surpluses, you also have the opportunity for raiding other societies to get some of their surpluses. If you're starving and, and, the, uh, and the clan that, that lives over in that next valley has some, some uh, grain that's stored up from last year, well, it, that's a pretty strong incentive to go over and, and raid them. So increasing raids then incentivize the creation of permanent soldier military classes, specialists in violence. They also encourage the development of specialists in, in management of surpluses, people who are uh, counting the stuff out, you know, development of mathematics and writing, and, uh, and, and people who are just sort of overseeing the whole thing. 
a, a, a permanent sort of uh, uh, ruling class. So all of this happens without anybody intending for it to happen. Nobody started out and s to say, well, we, what we need is a ruling class. <laughs> you know, what we need are permanent specialists in violence. Nobody thought that, but it just it sort of naturally happened. And, uh, and one century to the next, the whole ball, once it gets rolling, it's, it's, it snowballs. Uh, and, and here we are. Uh, once the, the thing takes on the, the power of fossil fuels, uh, then you know, it becomes a, a globe-spanning single megaculture that chews up everything else around it. And, and here we are. Once again, you know, nobody intended for this to happen. You can't really say it was a mistake because there was no particular point back along the way where you could say, oh, if we do this, then all of that is likely to happen. No, nobody could see that. It was just people doing what seemed like was absolutely necessary and, and reasonable given the situation they were in. Well, you know, we human beings are not, I don't think we're, we're uh, just genetic planet destroyers. Um, lots of human cultures have existed on this planet in, in sustainable ways for hundreds, thousands of years. Uh, but different human cultures uh, arise as a result of different environmental conditions. We're all pretty much genetically the same, but we respond to our environment and develop different ways of thinking and acting in the world based on what we have to do in order to get by. It's kind of like um, a situation in, in, uh, in, in other ecosystems uh, where uh, you can have an, an introduced species, uh, an invasive species come in, and suddenly there's all sorts of competition and disruption that occurs within the environment. There are lots of examples of this, the, like the cane toad in Australia, you know. Uh, farmers bring in this, this toad to eat insects that are, that are chewing up their sugar cane, and the toad has no natural predators and starts proliferating all over the place. It can eat absolutely anything. It's omnivorous. It eats marsupial mice and birds and everything else, and nothing can eat the t cane toads because they're poisonous. So you get, you know, millions and tens of millions of cane toads and, and everything else is, is making way for it. Well, human beings uh, can act either as uh, members of climax ecosystems where we integrate ourselves into everything else that's going on, or we can act as invasive species like the cane toad. We've done both things. It just depends on the, on the circumstance. Now... Um, the classic example of human beings acting as an invasive species, of course, is Europeans over the last 500 years or so. Europe became an ecologically full environment in terms of human beings. Uh, and so Europeans figured, well, if they were going to uh, avert ecological suicide, they'd have to go out and find some other places to be and take over some other environments, and that's what they did. Uh, they aren't the first people to do that. It goes all the way back to the uh, the end of the of the Paleolithic era, when you know people first uh, the first people to come to North America. The first thing they did was start killing off the megafauna. North America used to be home to you know horses and giant sloths and and uh, megafauna of all kinds, and the, the first human beings here killed them off pretty, pretty quickly, but they learned a lesson from that. And the people that we think of as Native Americans, who are the descendants of those people, we regard as intuitive ecologists, which, which is a pretty accurate conception, I think. But how did they learn that? They learned by trial and error. They learned that if you just kill everything around you for food, you'll eventually pay the price for that. Well. Europeans have been, unfortunately, <laughs> so successful acting as an invasive species that uh, they, uh, the descendants of those Europeans haven't yet learned those lessons. And they're teaching that strategy to everyone else in the world, which is also disastrous. So ultimately, what we have to do is learn once again how to be indigenous people, wherever we are. However long we've been anywhere, we have to learn those ecological rules, just as the Native Americans did. Now, the Native Americans had 10,000 years 
to learn how to be uh, uh, ecologists. Uh, the rest of us are going to have to learn damn quick. Well, the story of civilization, and particularly industrial civilization, the, the, the great party we've, we've been living through the, for the last few centuries and the last few millennia, has it been so great? Well, in some ways, of course, we've, you know, we've managed to accomplish a lot if you, if you look at it just in terms of, of our ability to, to grow in our numbers and our, our power to control the environment around us. Uh, but the impact on, well, first of all, on the environment itself has been horrendous, but also uh, the impact on ourselves psychologically and culturally, I think, has been uh, profoundly negative, actually. Um, we've become uh, neotenized in a certain way. It's like we've become infantilized is maybe another way of putting it. Uh, you know how uh, infants, small children, are dependent on their mothers, their fathers, their families, people around them to provide for them. Um, and I think as civilization has provided more and more for us, it's made us more and more infantile, so that we are less and less able to think for ourselves, less and less able to provide our, for ourselves. And this makes us more of a herd. We develop more of a herd mentality where we uh, take our cues from the people around us, from, from the authority figures around us, and, and uh, we develop our, our worldviews based on, on what, what the herd is, is, is doing and thinking at any given time. And, uh, and it really saps our ability to uh, to, to act authentically from a place within ourselves that, that is, that, that's mature and, uh, and, and real. Uh, so the, you know, this, this kind of psychological dilemma of the modern civilized human is, is, is pervasive. And we try to find all sorts of ways to to deal with that, you know, we go to therapists and and we we self medicate with alcohol and drugs and and we develop all kinds of surrogate activities, whether it's uh, playing sports or uh, um, or or getting all involved in in hobbies and and, um, and, and controversies and politics and, and so on, and it just takes us really further and further away from ourselves. And it, it's really so sad, you know, you, you, you look at, at, and particularly American culture is emblematic of this. You go to a, a typical shopping mall and look at the people around you and the environment around you. And the, the utter shallowness and hopelessness of it all is, is, uh, is profoundly depressing. <laughs> But it doesn't have to be this way, you know, it, and, and it won't be this way because the whole exercise is, com is completely unsustainable. So actually, as all of this starts to shift and change and disintegrate and collapse, there's the opportunity, in fact, to, to come back to ourselves, to grow up fundamentally as people and as a culture. Every, everybody has their, their, their little comfort bubble. You know, all of their, their tools and toys, their, their car, their TV set, their computer, their furniture, and all of these things. And they're completely insulated from the support mechanisms that enable all of that stuff to exist. Where does their food come from? It comes from the store. Where does all their stuff come from? Well, it comes from the store. You know, and how do you get the stuff from the store? Well, you go there and you give somebody a plastic card. You know, what does that represent? Well, it represents money. Well, what's money? Nobody has a clue what money is or where it can't, comes from or how it's created. We're living in this, this little bubble. Every one of us is living in this, in this little comfortable bubble that's completely disconnected from the real world of animals and plants and soil and water and natural forces that produces everything that's of any meaning whatsoever on this planet. Well, I think in the best instance, 
uh, will look back on the time we're living in now as a tremendous cultural lesson. Um, you know, when, when uh, societies go through tremendous hardship or spectacular events, they, they, those hardships, those, those events tend to become um, embedded in the mythology of the culture. They, became, they become a kind of collective memory and they're imbued with, with moral and ethical significance. Um, I think the, the, the challenges that, that we are facing now and, and the catastrophe and the collapse that's, that's likely to overtake us over the next few decades um, are likely to be seared into our collective cultural memory as an object lesson in something that we did that we should never do again. <laughs> I think we will, we will learn that the world has limits and that the highest human good comes not from getting more stuff and controlling other people, but from serving one another and from fitting in to the way nature works. Those are the lessons that we desperately need to learn. And I think when all said and done, those will be the only possible lessons that we can take away from the kinds of, of experiences that, that we have in store for us right now. Yeah, I think as, you know, as all of these things feed into one another, the global climate change and natural disasters and economic collapse and shortages of, of, of uh, uh, basic materials like oil and natural gas and, and, and food and topsoil and fresh water. Uh, as all of those things feed into one another, then the, the, the lesson ultimately will be inescapable. I mean, we may be able to um, blame one event or another on you know, this scapegoat or, or that natural disaster or whatever, but the cumulative effect of it all, I think, will be um, incontrovertible. We human beings have just come to the point where there are too many of us using too many resources too quickly, and the only way that we can survive in the future is to reduce our footprint on nature, to reduce our demands on what the rest of nature can provide. The unveiling, the revelation, the apocalypse. Uh, what's, what's being revealed? What needs to be revealed? Well, um, a lot of things, actually. Um, but ultimately, it's just simply the, uh, the unsustainability of the way of life that we've created. Now, we've created it for all perfectly good reasons. Every step of the way by which we got here was completely understandable. Every step of the way made sense given the factors that we had in front of us and so on. But we've marched out on the far end of a very spindly and shaky ecological limb, and that limb's about to become detached from the tree of life and fall to the ground. So we need to very carefully but quickly creep back to the trunk of that tree. Uh, and, uh, you know, the sooner we understand that, the better. There are all sorts of stories and understandings that are, can be revealed along the way in relation to that. I mean, all, all the little nasty little secrets about, you know, who profited f from and who manipulated us along the way to getting out onto this shaky ecological limb. limb. You know, there's, there, there's a lot to be revealed in that regard. Uh, and I'm sure there's a lot to be revealed once we get back to the trunk, you know, in terms of uh, remembering how life works and, and how wonderful life can be uh, when, when we are living in a more self-sustaining and uh, um, you know, psychologically regenerative life uh, as, as a culture that's rooted in, in the land and in nature. Fundamental cultural change 
typically comes about at the infrastructural level rather than the superstructural level. Now, every society has um, an infrastructure, which is how people get their food, how they relate to the natural world, how they get all the basic stuff out of nature that enables them to create a society. Then there's a structural level, which is politics, how we, how we make decisions, how we divide up all the stuff that, that we have. And then there's a superstructural level, which is consciousness, how we explain it all to ourselves, religion, spirituality, uh, political theory, and theory of all kinds. Uh, all societies have, have all three of these spheres. And change at any one, in any one level can change society. But I think we have, have gotten too taken up with the idea that you know, we can change the whole thing just by the way we think, or we can change the whole thing just by the way we, we organize ourselves politically, you know, whether we're capitalist or socialist or this group is in power, that group is in power. In fact, if you look back historically, wherever there's been change at the infrastructural level, the level of how we relate to the natural world in a, in a real, physical, on-the-ground sense, Wherever there's change there, everything else has to, has to reorganize itself in response to that. I mean, th think about it. If, you, if you're getting your food from hunting and gathering, you're going to have a spirituality that's, that's based in uh, animism, where you see the whole world as being alive. If you're getting your food from uh, agriculture, where you have um, you know, uh, food storage and, and the kind of social hierarchy that builds itself up as a result of that, you're going to have a, a, a religion and spirituality based on a hierarchy of gods and goddesses, or maybe just one great god, like one great pharaoh or, or whatever. Uh, and the, the same with how people raise their children, how they make their political decisions. All of that is predictable on the basis of how they get their food. So if we're going to create a new world, a new way of life, I think we have to start not just at the level of, of, of ideas and feelings and concepts or political change. I think we have to start with infrastructural change. Now that's going to be taken care of for us at a certain level because you know we're, we simply won't be able to maintain the oil-based infrastructure that we have now. So that, that kind of change will be forced on us and that will cause change at these other levels of society. But if we can get out ahead of the curve and start to create new ways of living by through permaculture and, and biodynamic and, and biointensive gardening where we're uh, not getting our food from the store but re-engaging with the natural world in regenerative ways that are in proportion to what, what the natural world can actually provide for us and doing it consciously in a way that maybe we've, we haven't done for many generations. As we do that, that's where real cultural change will come from, real pervasive cultural change, and that's where we'll see the real payoff for our efforts, I think. If you're still living the same way, uh, getting your food from the store and, and, uh, and, and uh, tied into the economic system uh, the way everyone else is, then subtly and probably without your even knowing it, your, your, your belief system is still going to be anchored in, in the same place everybody else's is. So, so real cultural change is going to come from actually the, the actual physical act of removing those those chains and uh, and setting down roots in the soil. Well, to me, uh, uh, the word sacred, um, I can't help but thinking think of it in, in sort of almost anthropological terms. What's what's sacred involves um, an inviol inviolability on one hand and a taboo on the other hand. And this is true, really, across cultures. Uh, um, so the inviolability of it is, okay, what, how does nature work? And uh, yes, by being here on the planet, I am impacting the natural world. It's unavoidable. I have to eat, and just by my being here, I am causing uh, death and suffering for other creatures. Okay, um, but on the other hand, um, I want that impact to be as, as minimal as possible. 
because I, I respect other creatures, other organisms, right to exist as, as in a sense as much as mine, ultimately. And, uh, and I, I want them to have every opportunity for the, the same experience of fulfillment as I hope to have for myself. Uh, so the, the taboo is, okay, what are ways of acting that, that would cause unnecessary death and suffering for other creatures? Well, that, that's the essence of, of taboo. So that's, that's where ethics come, that's the basis for, for an ethical life as far as I'm concerned. And all spirituality is ultimately about ethics. You know, it's, it's funny, I, I do this exercise where, with my students at New College, I put three words up on the board, spirituality, religion, and fundamentalism, and then I just ask them to free associate words with all, each of those. And you, as you can imagine, spirituality has all these warm, fuzzy words attached to it, and religion is more like, you know, um, regimentation and doctrine and so on. And then uh, uh, fundamentalism has these really awful words attached to it, you know, domination and control and war and so on. But nobody ever uses the word ethics or morality for any of those words. You know, they just don't come up in people's minds. But in fact, I think spirituality is all about ethics. That's why we have spirituality as, as a, you know, as, as an organism, a human organism. We developed spirituality because we have language and because we needed to coordinate our behavior in such a way as to perpetuate our survival on the planet. So given those two, two things, the need for survival and language, it was inevitable that we would come up with something like religion and spirituality. And of course it's become uh, uh, destructive and perverted as, as, our, as our culture has become uh, an invasive culture. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that way. That's not, that wasn't its original purpose. Yeah, well, you know, we human beings have done some horrendous things to each other and to the world around us. But I don't think that there's much uh, use at this point in pointing fingers and finding who's really to blame, you know, who's really uh, at the, at profiting from it all and so on. And there, there's, there's no question there are some, some really nasty characters out there in the world doing some horrendous things. But, you know, we have, a, uh, we have some tough times ahead of us. And we're all going to need to, to get through this together one way or another. And, and we will do so, I think, most effectively by linking hands and, uh, and understanding the kinds of motivations that cause us to do really stupid and, and horrendous things. Uh, because if, if, we can, if we can forgive ourselves and each other, and get through this, then you know the, the, maybe we'll have time on the other side to look back and and shake our heads in disbelief that we ever we ever did those things to each other and, and the world around us. But if we just get get caught up in the, in the finger pointing now, you know there'll be no end to it. <laughs>